things that I did was towards uh, four years ago, I went on a tour of incubators across the South. I visited about 28 of them, and I was trying to just learn some best practices that I could use and take back to our incubator. As fate would have it, I ended up in the Bay Area at the time of a Maker Fair. How many people here have heard of a Maker Fair? Okay, great, excellent. The one in the Bay Area is the granddaddy of them all. 110,000 people attended last year. And for me, it was just remarkable to see grandparents with their grandkids walking hand in hand, then talking to people who were dressed in steampunk garb, showing off their bicycle that was covered in a cupcake that they were riding around the parade runs. I mean, this is a place that was full of creativity and a lot of things I hadn't seen in a long time, because 25 years ago, now going on 30 years ago, I was a manufacturing engineer. I learned about industry, production, and then sort of left that space. But here we had all these people using some remarkable tools and doing so many fun things with them that it kind of um, made my incubator ambitions kind of pale. I felt something was going on here. And so I sort of committed the next few years to figuring out what that something was. And I did that by going to make affairs, <laughs> visiting things called maker spaces, and then also founding my own so that I could just understand what was going on here, why was this important, why was I even getting excited about what I saw in these places. And so today I'd like to start off with um, just giving us a common background. And that kind of background is going to be spent not so much about what you can do with making in libraries. That's tomorrow. I'm going to be going over what's called stages of readiness of libraries, models for implementation, which is an article that I had printed in the uh, American Library Association magazine in January. And then there are five discrete projects, which I've talked with a lot of people about, but which, if they were implemented, could make it easy for libraries to get more making done more easily. But this is tomorrow's agenda. Today I want to have us have a common background. You know, just the fact that I said makerspaces, I'm sure everybody here, because it's a leadership group from libraries, have heard of makerspaces, but I want you to understand through this story that I'm going to tell what it's really like in these makerspaces and why they're important. So I'm going to be talking about making, because right off the bat, it is somewhat preposterous for me to go up to somebody and say, I'm really excited about making. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous. I mean, making has been around as long as there have been tools, right? So how is it that going to be something new and important and uh, something that I could get excited about and that I think a lot of you folks would be excited about? So I know when I run out of time here. Um, then I'm going to take you on a little odyssey through makerspaces. I've been, I stopped counting around 68. I'm probably approaching around 100 maker spaces that I've visited. And it's just out of curiosity. They're all different. They all have different groups of people. They all focus on slightly different things. But there's a common energy, and there's a common excitement. And I didn't know it until maybe six months ago, but that energy, that excitement, is centered around a learning exercise that they go through without even knowing it. And it's participatory learning as applied to maker spaces. So this, so that we have a common background, is what I'm covering today. And those of you who choose to come to the next set will hear these things that are library specific. Because as I've done all this, and I've seen many, many maker spaces, I also realize that they're all idiosyncratic. That is to say, these 17 people got together and they found this one warehouse, and they managed to get together and organize a space, and it's totally different from this group over here. And there's no saying that these people are going to be around in five years. There's no saying that they have the skills that are necessary to understand real estate, to understand insurance, to understand training, etc. All these ingredients that are necessary for a makerspace to be successful and to last into the future. But there are institutions of society, such as libraries, which will be here, which society says are important, and whose mission might be right for adopting new strategies, such as embracing some of these ideas, and so I then started to focus more on library opportunities, and that's what I'll be talking about tomorrow. Making. Simple word. Let's talk about why it's changed, how it's changed, <coughs> and what makes it important now. 
this picture almost says it all. I mean, it was done by skilled craftsmen. It used to take a long, long time to develop the skills to be these craftsmen. Everything from carpentry to metalworking to blacksmithing, it was something that took a long time to gain mastery over. You've heard the expression, it takes 10,000 hours of doing something before you get really good at it. Well, that's kind of what was the barrier between a guy who starts being a blacksmith until he reaches some level of competency. And so you couldn't end up with a person being great in 20 things. There were too many hours, too many years in a person's life to do that. But for a long, long time, the tools were dumb, and all the intelligence lay in the person's head and hands. Using tools, that's how they were making. And then as time goes through, time goes by, there were a couple of very important transitions. The first one was the Industrial Revolution, where we went from manual to mechanical. So now you had machinery doing things. And it was a, still a huge uh, investment to actually get that machinery going. But once you had the machinery, you could do things on a scale and with a precision and with a repeatability that wasn't possible before. And then along came the information revolution and computerized tools got into the picture. So you're kind of combining mechanical and computer. But when I was an undergraduate student studying industrial engineering, those machines cost millions of dollars. The software was clunky. It was just very, very difficult to work with. And uh, there were huge impediments for being able to put it into production. That was 25 years ago. You know, Moore's Law did start affecting tools, materials, and designs as we go along this path. Designs became smarter. Sounds a little silly to say designs became smarter, but the tools you could use to create designs became smarter. All of a sudden, you didn't have to know base level physics, etc. You could sit there with drawings and pull on a graphical user interface. You could do so many things. Tools became smarter, cheaper, and more capable, and materials did as well. Then, we had the internet revolution, which sort of took those tools that we've been talking about, which are now computerized and were designed software that you can use on these computers. It's so easy to use. And it allowed people to start sharing through the internet all sorts of details, designs. Um, you could collaborate with people so easily over the internet. And much like the open software world, which you probably remember from the 90s and early 2000s, was where I could write something, I contribute it to the whole, and other people could come take my work and build on it and contribute it back to the whole. This process of sharing designs and openness is now come to hardware as well. So these, developed, these developments are affecting the mainstream and dramatic changes are taking place. The reason they're affecting the mainstream is now, you guys have all heard about the buzz with 3D printers, right? Yes. Okay. When you see one of those things in action for the first time, you can't stop watching it. Now, it's, it's amazing the way it just builds up from nothing to something. Um, there are a whole bunch of other tools as well. Let's just talk a little bit about those tools. So tools, this is what, what's called a CNC mill. It has three axes, X, Y, and Z. And this is the milling head right here. This is what's called a subtractive tool. And it says there's a block of something in there, wood. And the computer has already been programmed to go about very precisely <coughs> moving over this wood and removing material. This is the mill head right here. This is the bit, and it's a subtractive technology. Now, these things used to be just uncannily expensive. This one's still relatively expensive for a consumer, around $17,000. Okay? But it's not $250,000. It's not $2 million. Things have come down dramatically. I was talking about how the internet allowed people to share designs. Uh, my daughter. <laughs> so this is a design that she downloaded from a site called ShopBot. She tweaked it by moving some of the hold points. She went ahead and removed the logo that they had on here. And then she printed those out and created these. Now you might say, oh man, my daughter's talented, huh? And I'd like you to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> but she's not. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you, it was only a few months later that uh, she was getting ready to go work on a Habitat for Humanity house, and she was expecting to have to hammer a lot of nails. And I watched her hammer nails, she's not very good at it. So she built this wishing well. 
It required 176 cedar blocks that you had to hammer them over and over again. Not very successful much of the time. And the irony is when she finished that project, she was pretty good at hammering. And then she got a project with Habitat where they were disassembling a house. Ah. <laughs> Anyhow, she was able to do this. So she put this large piece of plywood onto a CNC mill, which you just saw, produced all the basic parts that you see there, screwed them together, or nailed them as the case may be, stained them, and produced this. Now, the reason she was able to do that was because this design was shared. That is to say, somebody else did it, put it up on the internet, and they could, I, my daughter could use this as a starting point. That starting point allowed her then to also tweak it. I told you about how she took the logo out of there, made a few hold point adjustments, because she cut this thing out of two sheets of plywood that were half this length, so we had, she had to move the pieces around, okay? But she was able to tweak it, starting with somebody else's work. And then she was able to use a CNC mill to produce this. So that's remarkably empowering. Not something you're about to say, see any day soon in the middle of the library, but the concept is really important. 3D printing. I think this one gets such a buzz because it's just never been possible before. You know, it just sort of like blows people's minds to see this happening. Um, much like the CNC mill, which is computer controlled, and it's told X, Y, and Z how to go about doing its job. Where the mill was removing material, it was a subtractive technology. This is an additive technology. It starts at the bottom, and think of it as an automated hot glue gun. Okay. So it goes around and squeezes glue out all over the place and then rises. And on the next slide, I'll show you how it works. This is a one in process. So it starts at the bottom, keeps adding plastic, going back and forth, and eventually you get the product. Now this owl originally was facing the other direction and was four times larger. But my daughter and I didn't have patience for that thing to print out. <laughs> so we uh, had downloaded this, again, shared design of the site called Thingiverse. She did a little bit of tweaking and produced this. Seriously, this is amazing. And it's so accessible to people because of the things I've been talking about. Let's move on to the next thing. Laser cutter. Anybody seen a laser cutter in action? Okay, a few of you, okay, good. Um, a laser cutter is kind of the same as the last two I've been talking about. It's computer controlled, but instead of going in three directions, X, Y, and Z, there's no Z in this case. It's just two-dimensional, sort of like a carved jigsaw vessels, let's say, okay? It does it with laser light, and it does it incredibly precisely. When you put a piece of plywood in, and you already are starting with a design you downloaded, or that you created yourself, you step back after pushing go, and all these pieces will be cut out. This laser can cut, this is uh, one from my makerspace called um, uh, Nova Labs, and it is a 100 watt laser. It'll cut up to quarter inch plywood, acrylic, papers, woods, all sorts of things along those lines. And it does it with this laser head right here, which when it's in focus, has the power to cut materials up to that thickness. So, what can you do with this? Okay, now is my chance to look smart, okay? I made that. I made that, and it took me 10 minutes. Okay? I made that because I went online, I downloaded this pattern. I could never have generated this. I have nowhere near the talent it takes to do this. The person who did this did it in such a way that if I wanted to change it from 3 8 inch plywood to a quarter inch acrylic, all the dimensions would adjust. I wouldn't have to do anything other than say, this is where I'm headed, in this material's direction, this thickness. And this is an etching as opposed to a cut. These are all cuts. Look at the result here. These are through holes. It was all put together by me in about three minutes with Elmer's glue. Okay, I showed this to people. And I don't admit right up front right, that how I could end up doing this. But uh, they're, they're very impressed. And they should be. It's, it's a remarkable example of what laser cutting can do. Inside, you can see the pattern here. This is just etched on the surface. It reflects this pattern up here. It's, it's a beautiful piece of work. It, gives you, it gave me a tremendous sense of accomplishment to pull this off. 
So these tools are all basically <coughs> X, Y, Z, and either you're subtracting materials or you're adding materials, you're cutting materials. That's all those things do. But because of the shared designs and great software tools we have now, it's possible to do some incredible things. But it doesn't stop there. Because Moore's Law has affected computing as well. Cell phones have affected computing as well. For instance, I hear there's a petting zoo here. Is that what you said? A petting zoo. A petting zoo. You've seen the Arduinos? I mean, most of the time people hear Arduino, they say, I've heard that word before. I have no idea what it is. It's basically just a tiny, simple computer that because of its low cost, because of its relative ease in programming, and again, because of these shared programs that are out there in the wild that you can download as a starting point, have just been really empowering to people. So if someone said, you know, I'd really like to have a motion sensor on the back of my garage that when somebody goes by, will take a picture. Can't find that product on the, on the, on the market? Just make it and it's using an Arduino that would be doing that. However, Arduinos come in a variety of sizes and shapes. This is called a lily pad. It's a round one. These are holes on the outside are there in part so you can sew them into clothing. It's used a lot for um, clothing projects. Uh, this is a really tiny one, so you don't have to uh, worry about a lot of space. You can embed it in projects. But these over here are the other side of the equation. This is the thinking part, okay? This is the sensing and doing part. So let's take this cell phone right here. What do we have? In this cell phone, we have motion sensors, GPS. We have little vibrators. We have all sorts of incredible technology. So I have a friend who says, I am terrible with my plants. And yet my mother keeps giving me plants. I kill them in no time flat. I have no green thumb in me. So we had a class in my makerspace called prototyping, and everybody had to come up with a project. His was very simple. He wanted to be told when the moisture in the soil of his plants was too low, and he therefore had to water it. Very simple. You had an Arduino, you programmed it to constantly be measuring the moisture in the soil, and when it got too low, his, sent his output, which was a smiley face, turned to a frowning face. <laughs> that was his whole project. It was very easily accomplished with this stuff, and just for a few dollars, because the computing, the sensors, and what we call actuators, We've got the sensors part, that's the thing that sensed the oil, sensed the moisture, or sensed the motion, or sensed the brightness of something. So all those are sensors. The actuators are the switches, or the microphones, I mean the speakers, or things that you would trigger to do things on the other side. So you sense something, you have some thinking, and then you do something about it. And these things are another part of why making is so different. It is so empowering. People can actually innovate in their product. <coughs> and it's making it easier and easier and easier for people to do it. This is a product called Little Bits. It's a bunch of little modules. I can't remember exactly what the colors mean, but they are three things. They're either input, output, or process. Just like you'd expect in a flow diagram. It's impossible to put these things together in such a way that you can do any damage, because they're magnets. They only click together when you are doing something right. They will not click together if you don't do something right. This is a kid <laughs> designing electronic circuits. Blows me away. It's because they packaged that technology in a new way to make it really accessible. And this whole sort of thing is just, it's just transformative. It, it's a word that maybe you might think is hyperbole. It's not. It's transformative. I've seen it again and again and again as I've gone across the country. Just wanted to say we have little bits in the petting zoo. So. All right, little bits in the petting zoo. <laughs> so the effects on, on making in general. Now, we're taking the first concept about how making has changed, and then the examples of the tools, and we're putting them together here. So barriers have been reduced. It used to be that I have to go get an uh, electrical technician's license or become a licensed amateur radio operator, become a double E to do electronics. Not so anymore. It's much easier. I don't have to go about figuring out how to use a lathe, going over months and months and months of practice and making mistakes and learning to use my hands and my head to get good products 
Instead, now I can use these automated tools. So barriers to entry are reduced. You don't have deep silos of knowledge that are necessary. Barriers are reduced. More empowering to make. More people are in a position now to make. Going from idea to design to the product is something that was possible quite readily with software. I mean, if you get an idea, I want to make a spreadsheet that's going to calculate the, uh, the weekly uh, budget for the house. You can sit down with a spreadsheet and you can come up with that. So you can make product with software, software fairly readily. But with hardware, it hasn't really been around since maybe the 70s, the early computer days. Um, that was sort of the last free-for-all where you could actually, at a retail level, in a home, in a small business, do some hardware product innovating. Well, now you can because of these different tools, these tools and computing, sensors, etc. They're very empowering for people. The long apprenticeships that it used to take to get up to speed aren't there anymore. I, I went to, how many people here have heard of something called a tech shop? Okay, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a maker space that's been professionalized. It's kind of like a workshop where you can pay $150 a month and you can use all their tools and they have classes on how to use all those tools. I wanted to sharpen my, my 25 year old experiences with these tools because I hadn't done anything in forever. And I went there and I spent six weeks, I took 21 classes, and I learned to use all these tools, not with great competence, but to the point where I had a project that I completed on each of these tools, and then I started to combine the tools. I am not a super talented guy. The tools and the computing did all the work, okay? I was just learning to leverage it, and the sense of accomplishment that came out of that was just tremendous. Easier to engage in projects involving multiple trades. Because, of trade, because the barriers to enter are lower, now all of a sudden I can do something with electronics that requires woodwork, that might need laser cut acrylic. I can do all those things. Those technologies are accessible to me. So that is by way of background on how making, the word making means something very different in the context of what I'm talking about. Of course, making is a word that hasn't changed fundamentally what it means. When we talk about the maker movement, or we talk about the making revolution, we're talking about these ingredients. I want to make it so much easier for everybody to be able to make. Where in the past, all these things required so many hours and so much learning. And all this is happening across the country, and there are people there and there and there who say, wow, this is really cool stuff. I really love this stuff. But I can't afford that myself. I can't go ahead and get myself a CNC mill or a 3D printer. It's not quite to the point where you can go get it like you would a toaster. It's to the point where maybe a few of you, if you got together, might be able to do it. Hence where we're going with maker spaces. Yes? I'm going to be a stick in the mud. And I'm a, a teacher mm -hmm. learning a lot about all this stuff coming down with Common Core and how people need to be able to take knowledge gathered from you know some piece of information and get it back um, not in the way that we've, we've done testing before and I've been a little hesitant in doing something like this in my library because I see kids doing stuff that it's like it's so easy you know to make a beautiful PowerPoint presentation or a Prezi or some other thing but they didn't actually do anything, you know? I mean, they just copied this stuff from one place or another, and I... I, I heard this discussed, and there's obviously an element of truth in it, but for me, Travis Good, trying to figure out how I would create a solution to a problem I have with early days when the iPad first came out. The speakers were weak, I wanted to redirect the speaker my way, and if I did, I could hear it. Before that, I couldn't hear it. I had a need and I wanted to satisfy that need. I didn't have the skills to do that. I needed the tools to make it easy for me. I needed the downloaded software to work for me. I needed to not have it be really costly. And in applying all those things, because I could apply them now, where before I couldn't begin to apply them, I was able to innovate uh, on a product. So it may not be that I became a great craftsman by getting a mill, and I was able to produce work product where my creativity, my self-expression, my sense of accomplishment could well up to the surface and actually produce something. 
rather than my just saying, I don't know how to work with wood. The tools are empowering me to do something I've never been able to do before. And I think therein lies why this is important. If you hear this next section about makerspace, especially the last segment I have on participatory learning, I think you get a feel for why it's important that these things are there, because they're empowering folks to do things which they would otherwise find impossible. And yet, by doing these things, they feel so empowered, so accomplished, so able to make a difference in the environment around them rather than just being affected by the things around them. So hold that thought. Let's see where this goes. Makerspaces. The definition of makerspace is a shared space with tools where people with common interests can learn, teach. I can't tell you how much both of these things happen all the time out of the same people. One minute the person is learning, the next minute they're teaching, and then they're back into learning. It's, it's just remarkable how that happens here. Socializing, it's a big dimension to makerspaces, and collaborate around making things. All of this is happening around projects and activities. So let's talk about the formation of a makerspace. Uh, after I visited, I think it was around uh, 60 or so makerspaces, I said, this is great, I've loved seeing this, but I need to internalize what all this is about by doing it myself. I can look all I want, but it's not real until I do it. So I started a makerspace. And uh, I knew what the typical pattern was from having talked to a lot of makerspaces. How does this come about? Why do makerspaces even form? And I knew that in the beginning, you just have to find people who are feeling that same ache you were. You really want to play with these toys. You really want to make stuff. And you know that you could if only you had other people with you and you took the leap and you, you got some tools and a space, etc. And then you get a small enough community together by attending events that might be on mark. We happen to meet somebody. He knows another guy. He knows this lady. Together, you all get together. You start meeting at a coffee shop where there's free Wi-Fi. And you do it for a few weeks, maybe a few months. And you sort of get yourself talked up into a fervor. You can do this. We really want to do this. It sounds silly. This is just the typical pattern that I've seen over and over again. They start sharing what it is they'd like to be able to do with these tools, what the kinds of things they actually want to buy, how they use the space, what kinds of classes they teach, what things they'd like to learn. And then they all sort of uh, talk themselves up to the point where they say, yeah, maybe we should really explore this. And uh, they go about it. Now, you have no idea who these people are. They may have no experience in real estate, so they can't find the right kind of property. They don't know anything about zoning, so they don't know if they're doing the right thing. Um, they may not have any of the other prerequisites that can so often be a problem, but they know they want to do this space, and so they go about um, doing that. They build out a physical space once they find it. We had, in Northern Virginia, where I used to live, we had, um, it's a very expensive real estate market, and there was nothing that we could afford. So we found what I would call a sort of distressed property, distressed in the sense that we knew going in, it was going to be torn down in 18 months. It was going to be a parking lot, um, next to me, a, new, a new apartment complex was going to go in there. And so since it was going to be torn down, we were able to get it for half market rates. So great, we got that. We then found our insurance. We then found um, that we had enough people who were willing to take the leap, that we committed to paying the bills, and it was off and going. Then people started to empty out their garages. We have lots and lots of tools. We have far more many band saws than we'd ever want. <laughs> this is like people had an excuse to get rid of the ones uh, that were in their garages. But you accumulate tools, you develop safety and uh, use training. Uh, there's, there's this uh, maturation process that goes on. You start borrowing ideas from other maker spaces. You uh, organize, establish some operating discipline, and then you start staging activities, do some training, run group builds. Let me talk about these real briefly. Activities, um, we have uh, lots of times brought people in to just say, it's Christmas time, we're going to do glass bead ornaments. If somebody comes in and sort of leads a session, or we're going to go through soap making and scenting, or we're going to whatever. So these are activities that bring people in to just spend time doing something. We also have a lot of training on popular topics, so Arduino, Arduino 101 and 102. Some of our tools are tools which, if you don't use safely, it's a problem. 
And we don't let anybody use the tools until they've gone through this training. So our laser cutter, our 3D printer, our CNC mill, all these things require training. Um, and when it comes to group builds, that's where a bunch of people, let's say all of us in the first two rows here, say, we want to make a 3D printer from scratch. That's what we want to do. But if I went ahead by myself and ordered all the parts, then I would not get group discounts you know, for volume. I would not get to uh, share in the shipping costs of everybody. And so we've done uh, multi-rotor copters. We built those, built 3D printers. Um, and there's been a small wood mill that we've done. All around, we all want to do it. Let's make the build of material. Let's get together on a weekly basis. And then half of us will finish the project. <laughs> <laughs> the ambition is, of course, everybody would, but have to. And uh, let's see, it goes on to, you collaborate on ideas. You know, it's just a, a lot of fun. There's socializing all throughout this. Let me give you some examples of three of them that uh, I just happen to have nice pictures of. This is going to give you a sense of where they get located and uh, what they look like. This is, a, uh, this is an Omaha, and it's a sort of a light industrial warehouse. It's, 150 years old, but it looks pretty good right here because somebody's come along and is trying to rejuvenate it. And there's this one corner that the guy can't figure out what to do with, and that's where these guys set up the space. Um, maker spaces tend to have three kind of areas. There's this area that we call a clean shop, which is back here. This is where you do the things that aren't going to leave wood debris or metal debris. They are usually what you find there is soldering, 3D printing, uh, vinyl cutting, things like that. It's over here. Over here, an equally large area, is where they have mills and saws and things like that. And then what you can't see is this front quadrant here, which is where they have their classroom. Very typical of a makerspace. Clean lab, dirty lab, and then some sort of um, socializing slash learning area. That's, those are the, the breakdown of a typical makerspace. This one is in the basement of a historic building, but it's like the, um, I guess maybe they used to have old boilers down here or something, and they don't need all that space anymore, but they can't begin to rent it out for any money. It's in the back corner of the basement of an ancient building. And this guy, who's the president of it, came along and said, boy, I could put a makerspace in there. Very typically, it is that kind of space that a makerspace can set up in. And, um, and so in this one, it's a relatively small space, and they don't have any dirty tools, but you can see just by the way they laid out, different size tables, whatever they can get together. I mean, this, is, this is the way makerspace comes together. They're all set up in a row. They've got their projector overhead, their screen. Um, they have some sewing machines and some computers back in this area. They took on the character of what they could afford, what their members were interested in, <coughs> and it's just very different from the last one, although the same themes come through. This is one, where are we, Springfield? This is one that you guys should, um, if you get up to Chicago, consider go visit. It is called Pumping Station One, and it is one of the larger, more successful maker spaces in the country. Uh, this is their fourth space. I was there the week that they finally sort of considered themselves moved in from the last space. It was kind of a celebratory uh, event that they were having. And uh, I think there's something like 4,800 square feet. I'm doing it from uh, upstairs area. They are a bit disheveled right here, but they're very organized. Uh, they're running some national events. There's this, um, there's this crazy little thing where people take little cars that kids used to use. Power wheels. Power wheels, yeah. I said that. Yeah, power wheels. Um, and maker spaces build these things and they compete at maker fairs. And it's like a, a fantastically fun thing that people are doing. They all came out of uh, what these guys have been doing. So, I bring them up because they're a good example. If, they, if you happen to be up in Chicago, check them out. Uh, they're very worthwhile. You, you, I can't tell you much about it because I only got this one shot, although I did enjoy this guy playing the drums in the corner with his uh, B shirt and top hat. You know, it's, just, it, it's typical that these people are really creative and expressive and having a lot of fun. So those are, those are some examples of maker spaces. What goes on, I already described activities and classes, programs, are what I was describing with like the 3D printer with build. So if you're gonna be spending six weeks building 3D printers, you know, there has to be somebody who oversees it, there has to be a plan in place, there has to be a purchase up front. These, these programs are one of the things that uh, the, the better run makerspaces get to. 
And then there are independent projects, which is really where the personal creative projects come out. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, these projects. This is Leah. Um, she happens to be brilliant in all sorts of other things. Um, she's a MIT Media Labs PhD uh, graduate, and she took the Arduino and made the lily pad out of it. But it's been taken over by all sorts of people. Her, her, her project was to put turn signals on the back of her shirt or jacket, okay? So you can see right here, the Arduino is in the center of her back. She has an LED array down both sides. And here is an additional uh, LED controller. And over here, she has, so think about Spider-Man, who's about to mm -hmm. send you some web. Well, she pushes right there, and that turn signal comes on. She pushes it again, it goes on. Her particular desire of her product, and she happened to build it. And this is the controller that is used in a lot of sewing projects. This one was the result of uh, Brie Pettis, who is the founder of MakerBot Industries, that 3D printer that I showed you, and going on to the Steve, uh, the Colbert report. And Steve and Colbert got all excited about this, and just on the spur of the moment, challenged the maker universe. Said, here's, my, here's a model of my head, go for it. And these are just some of the examples of things that came out. I mean, I like the Gumby. I can't, this is, um, I should know what the Greek, uh, yes, yes. Um, this is one my daughter printed because we were living in the DC area. This inverse head, it's just an example of the creative expression that people had given a little challenge and the fact that these tools were so available and made it all possible. These are some guys I met in San, these are some guys I met in San Francisco. Now, this is, this is an interesting one. This, depending upon your age, you kind of get this or you don't get this, okay? <laughs> These guys are the right age. These guys have huge nostalgic feelings for Mario. And those boxes that you punch and points would come out and money would come out or whatever it was that came out because I'm not of that age. Um, but these guys had the idea that they wanted to create this box it is touch sensitive, touch sensitive, you hit the bottom, the light goes on, it plays the sounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and every ten, do you know there was a second sound that came when you... Got the coin. Well, when you, when you got a, an extra special prize. Yeah. Yeah. Every 10 or 20 times. <laughs> okay, you can't forecast when it's gonna happen, but it does happen every once in a great while. And they, they found that they had tapped into some sort of nostalgic vain in society and they ended up making these things that the, they posted it on some uh, website and they just started to go crazy but it's a great example of taking everything we've been talking about the ability for you or I to conceive of something like this and then make it real but then take it to the next level and generate commerce from it so this is the kind of thing which uh, they couldn't begin to keep up with demand we actually had a challenge that in the maker universe of how to go to scale but uh, they were definitely makers. He was a designer, didn't really know a lot of the tools that were necessary. He was a tech shop. He was an electrical engineer, but didn't know anything about acrylic or assembly or any of this stuff. So together, they got together in tech shop in San Francisco. And they conceived of this and they started to produce it. To get to scale, what they did was they, Tech Shop has about 600 members in the San Francisco store, and uh, they just posted something on the bulletin board. We need people who know how to use a laser cutter to start cranking this stuff out. And they just pay by the hour, you know? And uh, they had their own ability right there to start producing these things. And it's, it's really been kind of uh, fun to watch happen. So, modern making offers makers personal <coughs> I, I, I thought long and hard about these little phrases in here. I, I'm pretty, uh, pretty strong believer in all of these things. Personal growth, the self-expression, the sense of accomplishment. It's a quick sidebar. I told you I stayed in San Francisco for those six weeks when I was taking all these classes and, and learning this stuff. I met some long-term unemployed who were spending their time in tech shop, kind of trying to retool themselves so that they could maybe put themselves out in the marketplace, learn new software, learn new techniques. And um, when I first met them, they would not really establish much eye contact. They'd kind of been beaten down. You know, they hadn't found a job. They'd been 
trying, but they were not feeling too good about themselves. And then as they started to learn these things, and started to make products, you could just see them sort of get stronger, pull their shoulders back, talk with more confidence, establish eye contact. This was kind of impressive to me, that the sense of accomplishment that comes from making something, meaning you are controlling the output of something. It's not employers that are affecting you. It's not the marketplace that's affecting you. It's not the economy that's affecting you. You're not being affected. You're affecting the world. If you can make things, you get that sense of accomplishment. It's really a wonderful force. Access to community is one of the things that is a great outcome of uh, makerspaces. The opportunity to innovate and generate commerce. And while those phrases, I think, are all very important to what's going on there, there's, there's a whole lot more to it. So I've told you about making, I've told you about how making, because the tools aren't quite at the personal level yet, are <coughs> ingredients for why people get together and form major spaces. But even as I learned all this, it still didn't explain to me what was going on. What was this magic that I felt when I was in makerspaces? I mean, magic's kind of a corny word, but I couldn't understand it, so I had to call it magic, right? I mean, te technology sufficiently advanced uh, will appear as uh, magic to people, and this appeared as magic to me because I didn't understand it. Then I was talking to some people about um, uh, Henry Jenkins' work on participatory learning, something that he had done for new media stuff. So blogging, uh, video, uh, where people were collaborating around those kinds of uh, digital activities. And I read this, and apologies in advance because I'm gonna read it to you, okay? But this opened my eyes. And I'm gonna read this to you. I just want you to see if you can't take it in because then I'm gonna go to an example of one project, the life cycle of one project in my makerspace where you can see how this stuff plays out. And you can understand what that magic is in the makerspace. So participatory learning in Jew, acronym PLAY, is a learning environment that fosters heightened motivation and new forms of engagement. So heightened motivation, okay? And new forms of engagement, new ways of getting through, into things through meaningful play and experimentation. This is not hard work, right? This is not work. This is Play and experimentation, okay? Learning that feels relevant to a student's identity and interests. So if I'm not interested in the electronic side of something, I'm not gonna do a whole lot with it. But if I'm interested in the woodworking side of it, I'm gonna put a whole lot more of myself into it. It's sort of self-interest driven, which as I'm telling my daughter right now, she's going through college, find something you love and make that your work. In these participatory learning environments, people can find what parts of it they enjoy, and that's where they can excel, that's where they can contribute the most. Let's see, opportunities for creating and solving problems using a variety of media, tools, and practices. Well, you can see where that would be the case in the makerspace, right? In, this, in the case of what he was writing about, it was you know web publishing, photography, videography, that kind of thing. Co-configured expertise, co configured expertise. You got a group of people, they have different expertises. You sort of settle in as best you can as a group around the project to get them. Self, co-configured expertise, where educators and students pool their knowledge, their skills and knowledge, and share in the tasks of teaching and learning. As I said, it goes back and forth all the time. Back and forth all the time. And then an integrated learning system where connections between school, community, uh, excuse me, home, school, community, and the world are enabled and encouraged. It's not just the microcosm of a classroom. It's not just what's going on in a school. It's not just what's going on at home. It's like real world multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary dimensions to it. And so these are the kinds of things that went into describing participatory learning in that context of new media. And that is a jukebox. Slot 
I find that I have to do this overview because as I get older and as younger people come along, they don't know what a jukebox is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, just, it's a jukebox. You put a coin in here, and when you put a coin in, you're allowed to push one of these buttons. One of those buttons is going to play either the A side or the B side of a record. And when it does get chosen, this machine will slide across and then it'll position in front of the record that you've chosen. There's an arm that will reach out, grab the record, put it to either the A side or the B side, drop it onto the platter, the arm will come over and play music. Okay? Very simple, but maker spaces are a combination of all sorts of ages. Some people knew this from growing up and loved them. Some people had never even seen this stuff before. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind full screen and just uh, play it. Buttons up top. You have to either write them in, as you see on the left, or they're typed out over here on the side. Obviously, back in the day, they were all professionally done. There's the platter. It's going to go to the very end. There are, there's no computer logic in this. It's all mechanical. It hits the end so that it knows where zero is. Thud, zero. Okay? And it knows you picked up like number 15. Grabs it, flips it, puts it down, and plays. <laughs> And normally you get to hear the whole song, but you got the cheated version. Okay, if we can go back to the pitch, please. Um, so, by chance, somebody in our makerspace had an aunt. Do we say aunt in this part of the country or aunt? Aunt. He had an aunt. <laughs> he had an aunt that uh, was unfortunately having to go into a home. And so they were clearing out the house of everything. And uh, in the basement, actually just go to yeah, slide 32 and then hit the present button. Top right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so he, he went into the basement and he, he saw this there. Now, this machine must have sat in this basement for 50 years because it is beautiful. It is perfect. The leather inside on the back is in great shape. The plastic housing hadn't yellowed, hadn't cracked, hadn't aged. The mechanical buttons all worked fine. It was, it was really impressive. And he plugged it in in the basement of his aunt's aunt's house. <laughs> and he used it, and it worked. And he thought, oh, I have no place for this. Uh -huh. So where can I dump it? <laughs> his sentiment was really, I'll bet the guys at the maker space would really get a kick out of this. So he brought it in, set it up in our, our entry area. And uh, when finally it was in place, he plugged it in, and it didn't work. So just in the moving, something had happened. And um, what do curious makers do? <laughs> we opened it up. <laughs> so there was a lot of diagnosis that went on. And what turned out that we had a guy who worked on vending machines for many years. He understood the coin mechanism. Apparently there's a problem in the coin mechanism. But in opening it up and diagnosing it, he exposed everybody to how that mechanism worked and was able to help them see what the problem was. This whole front sort of swings out. And inside, you find something that a lot of the younger people have never seen. Massive tubes <laughs> and giant transformers. These are things that you don't need anymore when you're dealing with you know, five volts, 100 milliampere, tiny computer boards. But here, you did need those things. And as we started to go through all of this, we found a person who understood old tube electronics. I actually put together a class so that people could understand the comparison between digital circuitry and tube circuitry. <coughs> we were able to get it going, but what the fascinating part about it was, once it got going, I guess were two things. One, we didn't have any records. <laughs> <laughs> 
And other than, I think as a showpiece, and you could get a couple dozen records maybe, but what, what are you gonna do? Listen to those same two dozen songs over and over again? So that was one of the big revelations. It was really cool, but we don't have anything to play in it. And the other thing was it was all mechanical. There is a bicycle chain type thing. It goes along the back here, and makes everything go. There are little mechanical levers. When it hit the end and I went thump, that's because it was basically resetting it. You didn't know where zero was. So you could count up to the right point. There were little rotary dials on the front, which for every play, every time the arm laid down a disc and brought it back up, it incremented that rotary dial by one. So when someone came and they were trying to restock the machine, they could see which ones were most popular, which ones weren't. And to bring all those old analogs into the present and have a guy who did electrical, tube electronic restoration sort of walk us through and show us bad solder joints and explain to us what the tube functions were and that sort of thing. Another person was, as I said, the vending machine guy. But that's looking backward. It was a realization that we don't have records that started the next wave of thinking on this project. We don't have records, but we have a laser cutter. <laughs> what could we do with that? Well, one thing we could do is we could cut a lot of things that look like records. Why would we do that? Well, what if we had RFID on every record? Okay? So that it was just numbers 1 through 80. So that when you did have all the beautiful mechanical machinery doing its work, and the disc was put down, the arm wouldn't need a needle anymore. It wouldn't need an RFID reader. It wouldn't need a needle. RFID reader. So what? You've got a disc down there, and you know it's number 32. Ah. What if we had a controller in here that was also tied into a media library that we had on the server? But that's too limiting, because we only had about 80,000 songs. <laughs> so why not, in this age of Spotify, get all the songs that were ever done and make them available to be played through this machine? But how would you choose them? I mean, you've got all these pieces of paper up here. Oh, no, no, no. LED displays on each of these, and every week it can download the top 10 of a genre, put them into here, <laughs> and you have the most popular music on demand in eight genres, while at the same time preserving the old mechanical beauty of how this machine worked. And this was a project of collaboration <coughs> where people leaned forward when they could help, stayed out when they were disinterested, stayed close when they wanted to learn, and it was the right mix of people, it was the right level of interest, and it was, it was that magic that I was talking about playing out in one project. And basically everything I said is right there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> So while I didn't understand what the magic was, in the beginning of this presentation, I said the magic of makerspaces. This, this was the magic. It was participatory learning going on in a context that was modernized making, where your average Joe, which is what I am, can do some pretty impressive things and still impress people if I don't divulge how it was done. <laughs> So that's, that's uh, basically what I was shooting for. I think I've actually done it within the time I was shooting for. It's 501. And um, I wanted to give you a few things to, and you guys have pieces of paper, so it's all there. But this was a collection put together by somebody on, um, maybe folks may actually recognize this uh, URL. But it, they put together some great slides for librarians on Makerspace. This is the Makezine blog. It's kind of like the, the blog of makers, constantly coming out with great projects. Uh, Maker Fair, we already have half the room raise their hand if they've been to a Maker Fair. The closest one physically that's a, a big one here would probably be the one in Detroit in like the August time frame. Um, however, last year there were 92 worldwide and this year will be 110. So they are happening in more places and you may actually find one uh, much closer than that. 
Um, MakerCamp is a resource that Google and Make Magazine got together and did this last summer. This is a bunch of programming on their site, Google Hangouts essentially, where today's projects were maybe model rockets and the next projects were uh, how to do clay modeling and bake it to get solid objects. And there was a whole series of things that there were libraries across the country who chose to tap into those and those are available on demand for whoever wants to use them. Uh, but uh, visit a makerspace. Visit a makerspace because that's where you really get the insight uh, firsthand of what this is all about. So today, I covered uh, making, and we now know that it means a whole lot more than just what it used to mean because of these great tools, how it's influencing groups of people who are interested in the tools and what they can do to form spaces, and then what that magic is that's going on inside of these maker spaces. Now tomorrow, what I'm going to be covering are these things, stages of readiness. Now I've visited many, many libraries at this point, and I have to tell you that 98 probably larger than this number, 98% of the time when I talk to them about making, I get uh, deer standing in headlights. I don't know, it's, it's a, what are you talking about? We don't do that sort of a thing in a library. And that's why I just walk into a library. I'm not trying to find a particular person. I just walk into a library and talk to people there who are either volunteers or staff. And I've sort of, over the course of visiting many libraries, come up with what I call five stages of readiness where one stage in particular is really important because it's the thing that if you can get over the chasm, you sort of will have, I believe, catalyzed a culture change where people can see the value of making and how it is very much consistent with the mission of a library. Uh, and then it maybe can progress beyond that. But I'll be talking about stages of readiness, models for implementation. Uh, if you can't come tomorrow, then just check out the ALA January issue of the ALA journal, magazine. And then there are, over the course of all these conversations I've had, sort of five projects that have surfaced. Uh, Andy and I were talking about one, which um, is, uh, but I'll just divulge right now, which is the uh, whole projects database. You can't expect uh, a library to go from doing what it's done historically to supporting making if there isn't some sort of resource out there um, to help with defining projects. What do I need to buy to do this? What have other libraries done with this? How do I make sure it's successful? What's the right group size? What are the materials? How do you go about it? What's the curriculum for it? How do you do all these things? Um, and I happen to have been working with uh, Instructables. Yeah. Uh, they have a database of like, I think it's 80,000 projects. And they're very interested in helping with the um, uh, notion that libraries uh, do more making and making their project database available. So just using my stages of readiness, they've come up with a prototype, but they're looking for some people with li a library background to, to work with to maybe take it to the next level. Uh, but there are five projects in total, and uh, that was just one of them that I would uh, share with you. These will be covered tomorrow. And I believe if I push the right button again, I get nothing, so find out. I'm pushing the right button. <laughs> so we're done. But uh, any questions? Yes? How much is the jukebox for? What are you going to sell it for? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you should ask that because uh, I was the, the video that I used once before to show the jukebox in action, I was hoping to be able to use today because it's just great. Because the guy gave a tour inside the jukebox. And I went to the link and it was gone. So I was quickly trying to find one. But in the process of trying to find one, this short little one here, I found about 50 for sale. So check YouTube because it seems as though they have all sorts of jukeboxes for sale. But that one, I don't want to. Oh. <laughs> And there's a lot of heart left in this one, and I think the people in our maker space really don't want to give it up. But uh, yeah, AMI, 1946, I think it was. Right now. Any other questions? Yes? Two thoughts, actually. First, it would be really neat for you to go back the other way. Take a, a platter of acrylic, put it on your laser disc, and burn something that's never been on an on a analog device. I'm going to hear what it sounds like. Rihanna on a disc would be interesting never has occurred. Uh, they have seen examples of 3D printing doing that. It's, it's kind of a coarse version of the music, really? but it's, it's amazing. Somebody printed out a platter with the right grooves, etc., to be able to have it play on a record player. On an LP. Yeah, yeah. Second thought is, just, I'd like your opinion. I think 3D printing and 3D printers are one of the most revolutionary inventions that has occurred, frankly, since something like fire. It is going to completely change 
our society, because we're going from a society of an economy based on scarcity to something where you can build the contents of, of a gizmo you have to buy. So what's your comment? What's your comment? I think you're right in the long term. I think right now 3D printing is... Uh, yeah, 50, 100 years. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right in the long term. Right now, I, I find that 3D printing, uh, let's say for instance in Cleveland, uh, as you walk into Tech Central, which is the maker space they have in the lower level, the first thing you come across on the welcome desk is a 3D printer. And I have stood there and I've watched people come in and say, what's that? And I explain to them what it does and there's some examples there. And there are just things happening up here that never happened there before. It's just amazing to them when they realize that something's being made from nothing. They start thinking Star Trek and the Replicator and things like that. You know? And so I think it's, it's actually most important at this stage for what it can do in terms of people's thinking. But in maker spaces, what turns out to be sort of like the uh, allure is 3D printing. What people keep coming back for as the most productive tool for them to use is the laser cutter. It, it, it's incredible what you can do with a laser cutter. And I'm talking about the difference between tchotchkes and toys, which you can do with a 3D printer at this stage, or real professional quality, high-end work that you can do with a laser cutter nowadays. So um, I knew I was taking on a challenge to stand between the start of our session and a break. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to hang around. You're welcome to come up and uh, chat or whatever. But thank you very much. Hopefully some of you will come. If you're not going to come tomorrow, let me know so I can go home early. Okay? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you.